Ever since Copernicus showed us we were not the center of the universe, we have tried to emphasize that Earth is probably not that special or unique. As it turns out, that might not be the case after all. So today, we return to the Great Filter series to continue our look at the Fermi Paradox. As a reminder, one of the more popular solutions to the Fermi Paradox, the strange seeming absence of other intelligent life in our huge and ancient universe, is that Occam's Razor applies in this case and that the reason for the seeming absence of other civilizations is exactly that, they don't exist. While we can consider the possibility that they existed in the past, but all died out after getting technology, the alternative explanation is that they just don't occur much. Since there is no obvious reason why they wouldn't, we tend to assume that there are, instead, a lot of little steps and conditions involved in a planet becoming life-bearing and staying that way long enough for life to get intelligent. Each of those steps and conditions is called a filter basically a hurdle you would need to get past that filters out potential civilizations arising on that planet. Last time we defined a number of different types of filters, from lesser to greater, the former being ones that most will pass through, coin flip odds or better, while the latter is more comparable to lottery odds or less. I also mentioned before that you can often group related small filters into one great filter, though you cannot always do the reverse and break a great filter into a collection of smaller component ones. This series focuses on possible great filters, and while we discussed three last time, we are only looking at one for this episode and will generally stick to that. Our focus for today is the famous Rare Earth Hypothesis, and more specifically the conditions about Earth and our solar system, which might make it nearly uniquely suited among planets to host intelligent life and technological species. I want to emphasize intelligent and technologically advanced right up front, because for the Fermi Paradox we don't care about some barren, twilight planet hosting simple lichen, not unless that lichen has developed a complex and enlightened civilization building spaceships and radio transmitters. So while we can look at a place like Pluto and say, yes, there's a chance life might develop there in some deep subsurface pocket of muddy water warmed by nuclear decay or tidal heating, we can also rule it out as a place to look for alien homeworlds. There's just not enough energy flux there to allow a complex and fast ecosystem that would permit intelligence to arise. Brains are very expensive in terms of energy and organs demanding resources and have to be constantly of value at every step of an evolutionary progression. An oak tree doesn't have a brain for instance because it would offer no advantage to its survival, not when it has no means to implement any of the decisions that brain makes. So outside of the specific case of a Boltzmann brain or something parallel, where the brain just sort of blunders into existence fully formed, we are justified in assuming only a high energy environment could offer enough life to generate such a predator-prey mental arms race and do so quickly enough for it to have already happened. Evolution takes time, but more importantly, it takes generations, and more complex critters tend to have longer generational cycles. Bacteria can reproduce hourly, we do not. There have been an estimated 100 billion humans who have ever lived, or 10 to the 11th. We can estimate that maybe a billion times that many mammals have ever lived, or 10 to the 20th, most on an annual or longer generational cycle. Throw in insects who are far more numerous and have been around much longer, and you can go up about a billion times more, 10 to the 29. And if we include bacteria, perhaps a trillion times that many, 10 to the 42nd, have ever lived. Each of those organisms represents an evolutionary event, mostly a failed or meaningless one, but that gives you an idea how many of these events need to take place to generate some folks sitting around a campfire, sharpening stone axes and wondering what the pretty points of light in the sky mean. Most of those events had nothing to do with your genetic makeup. A better designed oak leaf is unrelated to your own DNA, 
but growing intelligence is a reaction to the entire ecosystem evolving, so it does matter. It is not hard for an organism to learn to eat grass properly. They don't need a ton of brains or sensory gear for that, they need it for responding to other animals who either want to eat that same grass or eat them. We will talk more about the brain race in the future, but for today I mention it primarily to emphasize how many overall generations and individual evolutionary events were needed to get here. If that is fairly normal, then we have to consider that any planet that can support less life, or requires it to live slower, is less likely to have gotten technology by now because of fewer of those evolutionary events. Make the year 10% longer, and the critters that breed annually around the food supply of seasons evolve 10% slower, though that is probably optimistic since they would need bigger food stores to survive the longer winter and therefore support fewer of those critters to do the evolving. We will talk about this more in the future, but for now it's important to remember that we're not discussing where life could exist, or even where technology might eventually develop, but where it is likely to have already developed. After all, the Universe is fairly young still. We'll start there. Once the Universe explodes into existence, it takes a long while to develop a structure where Earth-like planets can be common, and today we are going to try to assume that it almost has to be an Earth-like planet to offer a good chance for civilizations to emerge. So what do we know about Earth that matters? The first step is to ask about its basic position in time and space. Earth is not an old planet at all, the Universe was about 9 billion years old already when it formed. If we compare the entirety of time to one 24 hour day starting at midnight, Earth formed at about 4 o'clock in the afternoon, two thirds of the way through the day. Life didn't crawl up on land to an hour before midnight. Now you already know that it took a long while for enough heavy elements to form in dying stars to produce rocky planets like Earth, but it did not take that long. Earth's composition relates to the metallicity of our own Sun, that being all the stuff in a star besides hydrogen and helium, the only two elements that existed in any real quantity prior to the stars making them. We often also look at this as the ratio of ion to hydrogen in a star, ion incidentally being the most abundant element on Earth, just beating out oxygen, which is the third most common element in the Universe. The relation of those two is pretty important as well, since our oxygen-rich atmosphere only came after the ion in the upper crust of the planet became saturated with more oxygen than it could sequester, even with tectonic activity turning over a new ion. Oxygen is obviously very important to high-energy, mobile life forms, as is the oxygenetic photosynthesis process that provides all of our food and releases that oxygen. Oxygen that also, consequently, poisoned off the life that lived before then and used anoxygenic photosynthesis, or other far weaker energy sources that don't rely on sunlight. Likewise, oxygen is an excellent fuel, or oxidizer, and its sheer abundance everywhere in the Universe should tend to make it the preferred substance for critters to consume, we each use nearly a kilogram of it every day. Our Sun's metallicity, Z, is 0.0196, or meaning just under 2% of the Sun's mass is stuff other than hydrogen and helium. As I said, we are also often interested in the ion to hydrogen ratio, partially because it matters for planet formation, but mostly because it's a lot easier to determine both ion and hydrogen content of stars than most of the other stuff in them. From this we can make a good guess at the rest of the elements. Metallicity is a bit more intuitive though, and it is what I will use to discuss this. However, if you go hunting for more data, you will see as many graphs with FEH on its axis as Z for metallicity, and it helps to avoid confusion. So the Sun is 2% metals, and so essentially were all of the early planets forming out of the nebula that became our solar system. That got quite hot, and when the sun ignited it started adding radiation and solar wind to the mix. Planets lost all their helium and neon, the second and fourth most abundant elements in the modern Universe. They are quite light and easily blown away, 
and being noble gases, they're so aristocratic and snobby they won't even hang out with each other, let alone the peasant elements. Hydrogen, oxygen, nitrogen, and carbon are all pretty light too, but they can form heavy molecules that stuck around. However, the overabundance of hydrogen meant that most couldn't find any dance partners, and so they also blew away. Oxygen is likewise very common and will dance with almost anyone, so most of the hydrogen that didn't blow away paired up with them as water. So the warmer planets of the inner solar system are rocky, not so much because they started out with more of those elements than the Sun or the outer gas giants, but rather because those are the main things that stuck around under the heat. Their absence from the thousands of exoplanets we've found so far does not indicate rarity, it is just that it is far easier to see big planets and those close to their sun, so we see a lot of very big and hot planets. It would seem a safe bet though that you need a metallicity decently close to our own suns or higher to get many large rocky planets. The metallicity of stars is always higher the younger they are, not because they lose that as they age, but because as the universe ages the amount of metals increases as more and more stars go supernova, so the younger newer ones tend to be higher. However, there are plenty of stars younger than ours with lower metallicity and somewhat older ones with higher metallicity. Most are not however, we are pretty much in the thick of the bell curve in that regard. You can find a fair number which are a billion or more years older than ours with higher metallicity, but they start getting very scant at more than 8 billion years of age. We can, however, safely conclude that systems with lots of rocky planets, with the same basic composition as our own, have been quite common since at least a billion years before our own came into existence, and perhaps a few more. We generally divide stars into populations 1 and 2, and the really old ones are labeled Population 3, based on how much metal they have. That's a very broad and arbitrary categorization, so it might be that not all Population 1 metal-rich stars like our own Sun have enough metal, or that some Population 2 stars do. Indeed we found planets around fairly low metallicity stars too. What this establishes, however, is that we cannot consider the metallicity of our own Sun and its age to be more than a lesser or minor filter itself in terms of setting boundaries though those lesser filters can stack up, as we've discussed before. Ditto the fact that we often discard the inner galaxy as a place for life because of all the radiation and higher star density sterilizing planets or perturbing their orbits. But the spiral arms of our galaxy are quite heavy in metal-rich Population 1 stars, so this isn't much of a filter either. It should be noted though that the further you get from a galactic core in galaxies like our own, the less metals you tend to have. So we have a galactic Goldilocks zone, too close, radiation and perturbation, too far and there are not enough metals. But realistically it is hard to argue that this is much more than a lesser filter. So that gives us two lesser filters so far, we will treat both as 50-50 at the end when totaling everything up, though I suspect we're being generous for both and it's more likely less than 50-50. Of course, everything I just said applies only to stable, spiral-arm galaxies. When you look at other types, the conditions tend to be less favorable, and as I mentioned on this topic before, you can't just write off other galaxies from the Fermi Paradox. However, for today we will focus on our own galaxy so we can use its total stellar population as our comparison number at the end and also bypass further complicating stuff like quasars, galactic modules, and so on. Though it is also worth remembering that our own galaxy is a serious cannibal and has eaten a ton of lesser galaxies, though by and large this sort of process shouldn't tinker too much with how habitable various individual solar systems are. This and other factors have to be considered. For example, a star's orbit around a galaxy being stable and not passing through the hazardous core or too close to big dense pockets of stars. I will add that as another lesser filter and we will call that the Safe Galactic Orbit Filter. A lot of stars are also binaries or in packs so dense they would tend to destabilize planetary orbits, and we will make that our fourth lesser filter. 
again that's probably being generous. Now another one that gets suggested a lot is being hit by a supernova shockwave, or a dreaded gamma ray burst, but that needs some quick context. You need to be very close to one to get a planet sterilizing event that can kill off even deep ocean life, and that won't be too common. Nevertheless, if it kills off all large land life, which would take a lot less impact, you do get a substantial reset. Yes, lots of bacteria will survive, probably even lots of insects, and certainly stuff deep in the ocean unless we got really whammied, but they will recover fairly quickly and let evolution fill up the missing niches again. Extinction events are hard to classify for the Fermi Paradox though, that's because it's hard to predict how common major or near total ones were even in Earth's history, let alone that of other solar systems in general. Coupled to that, such events can often be beneficial, clearing and leveling the Darwinian battleground as it were. Dinosaurs were probably already on their way out, but if that asteroid had not hit, we might not be here today. So I'm going to ball up all the various extraterrestrial extinction causes, supernovae, gamma ray bursts, asteroid bombardment, etc., into one rather nebulous filter, and that one I will make our first minor filter. As a reminder, lesser filters were the kind we thought lowered the odds to no worse than a coin flip while minor was anything that most did not pass through but wasn't terrible odds, no lower than 1%. And for our final calculation today, I'll treat it as 10%, again we are using the favorable values. Now not all suns are the same, and while we call our sun a yellow dwarf, it is actually one of the most massive stars out there. It got that misnomer because in early cataloging we could only see the biggest and brightest stars just as now we can only see the biggest and hottest exoplanets. Interestingly, the Sun is about as massive as a star can be and still support life. Stellar lifetime shortens exponentially with a rise in mass, as its cube, so a star twice our mass lives one half cubed or one eighth as long. So if our Sun was even 30% more massive, it would be just about ready to die by now. To make things worse, since a star gets hotter as time goes by, its habitable zone will probably have shifted much more noticeably during that time, rendering some planets uninhabitable that used to be habitable. That is expected to happen here on Earth in the next billion or so years, even if the Sun's main sequence normal lifetime will still have a few billion years left on the clock. This is not a good filter though, because only a small percentage of stars are actually massive enough to live so short a time. It matters only if we are assuming life is limited to other G-type stars. As a G2 star, our Sun is fairly large even for other G-type stars. That scale goes from 0 to 9, with 0 being largest and 9 smallest. Of the 7 classic spectral types, O, B, A, F, G, K, and M, only K and M are smaller than G but each of those groups has a higher population than the other five combined. The habitability of all those stars is therefore of great interest to us, as they are way more numerous, and we did one of the earliest episodes on that topic. But we actually don't care about them for today's topic because of what I mentioned earlier about total evolutionary events. For a civilization to emerge, it needs a decently high number of those total events. It is a regrettably clumsy and ham-fisted way to look at the issue, and we'll spend more time on it later in the series, but for now, we have to consider that if a planet is tidally locked to a small red dwarf star, as we have decent reason to think would tend to be the case, that planet has a far smaller habitable region to support life less space, less life, therefore fewer evolutionary events. Again, we don't care if they've got life, we care if they've evolved into civilizations. We also need to keep in mind that photosynthesis on Earth does not use all of the Sun's spectrum, and smaller stars emit even less light in that photosynthetic range, less useful available energy, less life, more of the material in that life devoted to basic fuel gathering rather than other survival tasks, and so on. It does not mean all those stars are uninhabited, 
There's a lot of question marks about tidal locking, atmosphere slowing locking or being torched away, solar activity being more erratic, and so on. But they are not good candidates to produce civilizations, and they make up 90% of the stars. So I will give this one minor filter status too, though we will also attach to this category things that make stars erratic in their output as well. Our Sun is pretty stable compared to most. So we were at four lesser and two minor filters so far. How about planetary position? Each star has a habitable zone. We roughly classify that as any place where water is a liquid, not too hot, not too cold. That's very debatable since you could have moons around gas giants that were warm enough by tidal heating for instance, but it is a decently solid filter. Not because such zones are rare, every star has one, and we think most stars have planets these days, so one being there isn't too improbable. However, we have to consider three important factors on this. First, what are the odds that the planet is about as massive as Earth? Doesn't matter if some tiny planet like Mars is there, it could never hoard an atmosphere that close to the Sun for billions of years. Doesn't matter if a big planet like Jupiter is there, no life is evolving on a gas giant. Not to technological civilizations anyway, although maybe a large moon around one might. That last wouldn't seem too probable though since no moon in our solar system is even close to being as massive as Earth. Ganymede is the biggest, actually larger than Mercury though less massive, and has a surface gravity that's only 15% of Earth's. So we have to consider that it needs to be a planet decently close to Earth's own size, though how close is hard to say. I said three things though, and the second would be that it needs to be staying inside that habitable zone. Most planets don't have circular orbits. Earth has one of the lowest orbital eccentricities, Venus lower still, while Mercury has the highest. Odds are pretty good that the official habitable zones are already too generous and those near the edges won't be hospitable for life. If you add eccentricity into that it gets worse. And of course, even if a system has a habitable zone with planets near it, there might not be one actually in it. So we'll make that lesser filter 5. No planet of any sort happens to occupy the habitable zone when the system forms. For number 6, we will include the chance that the planet gets itself knocked out of orbit, or captured or ejected out of the system, or into the Sun. Orbits are not nearly as stable as we often think. Odds are better than good that not all of the planets we started out with in our solar system are still here, and probably aren't all quite where they began. Indeed it seems likely that at least one time Earth got smacked by one, and it's also a pretty popular theory that one nailed Venus causing its peculiarly slow spin, thus having a day longer than its year. Systems with more planets would probably be even more vulnerable to such things, especially if they had big planets closer in. The mass of a planet in the habitable zone, if we have one, matters a lot. We do not have a good inventory of planets yet to say what percentage of them are of any certain size, but we have started finding a lot of super-Earths out there in habitable zones or closer so we know there's no special barrier against their existing. In between things like Mercury and Jupiter is a mass difference of about 1000, and you could go bigger or smaller and still have that habitable zone dominated by that planet, so no others could be there. We cannot assume that planets are evenly distributed by mass that there's as many planets twice the size of Earth as there are half the size or ten times the size. Indeed what we do know suggests otherwise. But if we did assume that for the moment, then we have a major filter right there, because of possible planets, from dwarf planets just big enough to dominate their orbit, to super Jovians nearly big enough to count as a star, only a tiny range of those could plausibly support the kind of life we're interested in even if we are stretching plausibility. We will give this one minor filter status, or third, though it would not be hard to argue it was a major filter all on its own. We just don't know, and where there is uncertainty, we will err on the side of generosity today. So three minor, and six lesser. I'm going to bypass our day length and axial tilt, because those are very dependent on our moon, arguably so is crustal composition since the moon formed when we got whacked by some other planet or rather when two planets smack each other to form our current one and the moon. 
For a long time we thought the Moon itself such an anomaly that it might be a great filter all by itself, but newer models say that such giant moons might not be so uncommon after all. Uncommon or ultra rare, our big moon is a huge factor in all sorts of things that make our planet stable and livable, yet at the same time many of those factors just seem to better the odds for life, not really exclude it for Earth-like planets without a moon. So while we should probably still list the moon as a major filter overall, I will keep it at minor filter status. We used to be sure the moon was a key factor, as I said, but one of the examples for that is that life began in tidal pools, and the moon dominates those, but the sun alone causes decent tides, and we also tend to tilt more to expecting life to have emerged around underwater thermal vents, so I feel we should hedge our bets and say minor. Speaking of those thermal vents, our planet's tectonic activity and molten core are hugely important towards providing us with a protective magnetosphere, as well as ensuring plate tectonics that both give us thermal vents and help create a geological cycle that replenishes elements on the surface and ensures there is surface land that hasn't been eroded away, making the planet all one big sea. Yet while such activity is vitally important, and probably less common on smaller planets for instance, we have already excluded those and we don't have too much reason to think there's a very narrow zone of these permissible that most Earth-sized planets would lack. These are both very big factors though, a planet's magnetosphere controls whether or not it can keep an atmosphere in the long term, and the spin rate of planets affects that. While at the same time, the faster a planet spins, the stronger the erosive winds and storms trying to erode away the land. Too much tectonic activity could be devastating, indeed considering how many cities were ruined by earthquakes in the past, if those were stronger and more common, folks might never settle down to build cities, and yet too little of such activity and you wouldn't have land masses or the geological pump that brings up new minerals and helps sequester oxygen early on. Too many uncertainties. So again, we'll be cautious and call each just a lesser filter, placing us at 8 lesser and 4 minor. There are so many others we could look at, and many we've just shoved together into broader filters. There are many more still to come too, we've just looked at those which are characteristic of our planet's composition and position, those core rare earth filters. But that was our focus for today so let's total them up. Remember that we classified a great filter as something virtually none past, one in a million at best, and often worse. We also said that for our totaling today we would treat a lesser filter as 50-50 and a minor one as 1 in 10. Many of them we looked at today were probably way worse odds than that, but let's see how we come out with 8 lesser and 4 minor ones. Cumulative odds can just be multiplied together. The odds of flipping a coin is 1 in 2. The odds of doing so twice in a row, 1 half times 1 half, or 1 in 4. 3 times 1 in 8. So our 8 lesser filters are 1 in 2 to the 8th, or 1 in 256. Not bad. Our 4 minor filters, 1 in 10, are worse. 1 in 10 to the 4th, or 1 in 10,000. Combined together they equal 1 in 2,560,000, less than 1 in a million, so we establish a good case for the conditions on Earth to be a great filter. Incidentally, if we treated those 4 minor filters as just 1%, our lower end value 4 minor filters, it would be 1 in 2 billion, 560 million, not a million. But our goal was just to show that it qualified as a great filter not the worst case scenario. Even that value though would still leave a hundred planets in our galaxy with those conditions, and our more moderate value would allow for a hundred thousand, but it does seriously lower the odds for civilizations to emerge and flourish. Some folks stop here, indeed many of the filters we used could easily be boosted to minor filter status, not lesser, and in doing so would smash the odds down to a lot less than one such planet, a galaxy. But for my part, I tend to think we are in about the right zone with our figures, and that it is the filters that come after this in developing intelligence and technology that help sweep the odds further down. There is so much uncertainty to all of these values, 
and the reasoning behind them that we just can't say much for sure. But this is the basis of the Rare Earth solution to the Fermi Paradox, and as you can see, it makes a pretty good case for Earth-like planets that can foster technological civilizations to be quite uncommon, and possibly so rare that you won't find one even in the entire galaxy. Next time in this series, we will look at the biological side of things in more detail and see how all those factors can stack up to form yet another great filter, but before that we will be discussing some other topics, and in next week's episode we will examine the popular science fiction concept of force fields and see if there is any room for that to become a science reality, not science fiction, and also discuss some of the fun things you could do with them if you had them. For alerts when those and other episodes come out, make sure to subscribe to the channel, and if you enjoyed this episode, hit the like button and share it with others. If you want to discuss this topic some more, head down to the comments section below or join the over 10,000 members on our Facebook group, Science and Futurism with Isaac Arthur. Until next time, thanks for watching, and have a great week.